Hello and welcome to this Expo North session uh, with uh, the fab Rosie Wilby. I'm uh, Peter Erpeth and it's my uh, great pleasure to be able to do this interview with Rosie as her new book, The Breakup Monologues, is launched. I think it's out now. I've been out a week or so, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, to start this session, Rosie's going to give us a, a reading and uh, a bit of an intro um, from the book. Uh, but first, a bit of an intro to Rosie herself which will, of course, be familiar to many uh, watching, you know, from sort of um, stage, screen and radio um, appearance. Um, Ro Rosie is an award winning comedian who has uh, appeared many times on BBC Radio 4 programmes, including Woman's Hour, Loose Ends, Midweek and Forethought, uh, amongst many others. Um, her first book, Is Monogamy Dead?, was shortlisted for the Diva Literary Awards in 2017 and was longlisted for the Polari First Book Prize of 2018. Uh, very, very good um, nomination, that one. Her trilogy of solo shows, um, Investigating Love and Relationships, began with The Science of Sex, uh, which has been performed all over the UK and all around the world as well, actually, in New York, Los Angeles, Sydney, Berlin, um, and ended with The Conscious Uncoupling, which toured to venues, including London's South Bank Centre, um, and was shortlisted for the Funny Women Best Show Award. Um, also, of course, a regular at Edinburgh, uh, you know, I was speaking here from Inverness in Scotland. Um, but this is about her new book, um, The Breakup Monologues, which um, started on its own uh, road to existence um, in 2011, uh, when uh, Rosie very uh, candidly admits that she was dumped by email. Um, quite a modern phenomena back then. Obsessing about uh, breakups ever since, she's embarked on a quest to investigate understand and conquer the psychology of heartbreak <laughs> very timely i think um that quest proved to be creatively fertile one resulting in uh, rose's acclaimed and they highly recommended podcast the breakup monologues hence the title of the book and i think this is the first time that uh, <laughs> expo has ever done uh, an interview with someone about the book of the series of the podcast um, we've done books about TV yeah. series and radios, but never about a podcast. So that's a, a first. Um, for the breakup monologues, Rosie decided to ask her colleagues on the comedy circuit about their experiences of romantic disaster and recovery. <laughs> Uh, thinking, quote, if one group of people have become adept at learning from catastrophe, it is comedians. Uh, the worst on the stage deaths are the performances that enlighten us most about how to improve. Uh, <laughs> she's uh, wondered if comics have been able to transfer this fail better logic to love. Uh, the book is a love letter to her breakups, uh, a celebration of what they've taught uh, peppered with anecdotes from illustrious friends and interviews with relationship therapists, scientists, and sociologists about separating in the modern age of ghosting, breadcrumbing, and conscious uncoupling, um, all of which uh, informed me greatly. Um, it's a it's a very uh, very <laughs> some very detailed explanations was very helpful in the book. Our plan is to assimilate their advice and ideas in order to not break up with girlfriend her partner of nearly three years at the time um, when this was being put together. Um, will this self-confessed serial monomy, mo monogamist, I can't even say the word, a breakup addict finally settle down? Well, that's a question I feel very lucky to ask, to be able to ask Rosie herself, who is, of course, here. So, hi, Rosie. Hello. Uh, how are you doing? Thank you for that intro. Gosh, lots, lots to say there. Yes. It's, uh, yeah, illustrious uh, uh, CV and an amazing um, series of events. And of course, the live shows, you know, will be, as I say, have been sort of like Edinburgh and and then the, the jump into the to the podcast, you know. But before we get into any of that, what I, like mm -hmm. I said at the beginning of that intro is I think the best way to start, if it's okay with you, yeah. is uh, maybe let's just jump into the book. If you've got some reading to could talk us yeah. through passages that would be absolutely absolutely yeah. so i'm going to be reading from this is my proof copy but um the the hardback copy has a lovely beautiful uh orange and pink cover orange does seem to be the color of the moment so i'm delighted to be part of the color palette of of the uh, trending moment um and it's probably worth pointing out that you mentioned i was dumped by email in 2011 
And I actually did feel much better once I'd corrected my ex-partner spelling and punctuation <laughs> and, and changed the font, actually. Wingdings is much better for a breakup email. So I, I'm going to read to you a little bit from the prologue because that's where we sort of get to meet girlfriend. And so that gives a bit of a flavour of the sort of memoir sections of the book, which really look at how I've sort of learned from my breakups and from the fellow comedians, writers and academic experts that I've spoken to on the podcast, how to actually maybe navigate staying in a relationship that I'm committed to. So let's hear a bit from the prologue. You look beautiful today. Thanks, baby. You're a bit into me today, aren't you? I'm always into you. No, you're not. True. We're driving to a festival in girlfriend's midlife crisis car, an electric blue BMW convertible. Although the way she drives makes me wonder if you can still describe it as a midlife crisis if it ends up killing us. That would be an end of life crisis and quite a crisis at that. Never mind. The sun is shining. Our life is good. We have a fancy loft conversion. We go on ski holidays. We Google things like, can dogs eat monge too? After two decades of scratching out a creative existence from gig to gig, first as a wistful indie songwriter and then as a willfully grassrootsy comedian, I now get to live like a wanker because my libido went all aspirational on me and drew me to a partner with an actual job. However, three months shy of our three-year anniversary, shit has got real. Girlfriend and I have reached a refreshing level of frankness about the fact that our mutual desire has waned. We have teetered and toppled over the parapet of honeymoon bliss and fallen to the ground below, stirred from the anaesthetizing effects of the sexy brain chemicals that have propelled us along thus far with relative ease. Suddenly, we are acutely aware of the careers and friends that we have neglected during the happy haze. We have reached the stage where being in a relationship with a fellow human has become a massive pain in the arse, even though it is a largely excellent relationship that neither of us intends to leave. Repeat, we are not going to break up, not for the foreseeable, not us. In fact, it is the first time I've reached this point and not been planning a daring dramatic escape counting up the significant partners whom I probably would have married if it had been legally available to me all along. I'm now on to my fifth wife. That puts me on a multi-marriage par with Joan Collins already at the age of 48. She was 68 when she married her final husband. If I was going to continue to be a slave to serial monogamy, and if you're reading this, darling girlfriend, of course I'm not, I would have ample time to overtake her and catch up with Liz Taylor and her seven husbands, one of whom she married twice. But I'm done with twisting. I think I'd like to stick. I found a funny, sexy, generous partner, even if she does have a ridiculous knobby car. Surely if I left this one, I'd be breaking up with love altogether. It would be my end game. And it is from this position of at least wanting to stay, of accepting the maddening claustrophobia of companionship, that I want to investigate why breakups continue to compel me so much. Perhaps it is because breakups facilitate and maybe even necessitate transformation. In the wake of a separation, our peers allow us to reinvent ourselves. The rest of the time, they like us to stay fixed so that they can move around and ahead of us. But heartbreak is the golden ticket that circumvents this bullshit, renewed and reborn, standing at the edge of the echoing canyon of our former frustrations. We shout, this is who I am now. And we run and skip away from the parched carcasses of the old selves we have grown to hate. For me, it has been during these fleeting, liberating gaps of singledom that I've really got shit done. I recorded and released an album. I launched a boutique music PR company. I started comedy. I wrote a book. Each time I harnessed any lingering feelings of anger, sadness and confusion and used them as energising forces for creativity, for moving forwards with new insights into my own shortcomings and foibles. I wonder if it is possible to do that much learning and actively stay 
in a relationship? I hope so. It must be, right? Or else all long-term couples would be codependent, emotionally stunted weirdos. Oh, hang on. So that's a little section from the, the prologue there. Now, next, I thought I would fast forward to a section from the second half of the book. The book is actually written in sort of two... I mean, there's a fun section in the middle with that's sort of a bonus with playlists of breakup songs and some lists of breakup films. But the two main sections tell the story backwards and forwards. And I've likened it to a child's butterfly painting where you kind of fold the pages over and whether we can look at our relationships in a certain time span in our lives in a sort of palindromic way where perhaps we look backwards and then forwards with a different perspective. And so in the forward section... I'm really feeling more optimistic about my relationship and less critical of girlfriend and realizing that I really have learned from my past relationships how to have made a better choice this time around. And there's a chapter where we are on holiday together at a friend's apartment in Spain and we kind of have a, a fun bonding experience and we've had this lovely conversation on the balcony the previous evening, sort of talking about how we found a good connection and how we've built a healthy relationship. And I talk about drifting off to sleep, gazing at the hypnotic rotations of the ceiling fan. I think about how breakups, while they may hurt at the time, really do shape us in good ways and equip us to make better choices. So let's find out what happens the next day. The next morning, one of our neighbours, a tanned local man, walks across the shared courtyard towards the little oval pool as we are opening up the balcony doors. Buenos dias, he shouts up, smiling from under the brim of his straw hat. Girlfriend leans on the balcony rail confidently and shouts back, Buenos Aires. I do a double take. Did she just say what I thought she said? She seemed so sure of herself. Surely not. I won't say anything. The man, nodding and still beaming, walks on. After an al fresco breakfast of nectarines and fresh fluffy bread, we walk down the steep, quiet road towards the beach. Coming back up this isn't going to be fun. I hope we haven't forgotten anything, shouts girlfriend after me as I break into a jog ahead of her, desperate to get into the sea. I think I'll look into hiring a car. Whatever you reckon, baby. Once we walk briskly across the hot sand and settle onto some recliners under umbrellas, we take off our T-shirts, ready to go for a swim. A man on the plane did warn us about the sea at Mohaka. It's very rough in the mornings, he said sternly. But it looks fine. A few waves crash up the beach and tickle our toes. Girlfriend steps forward until the water is up to her middle. I follow. Then the floor suddenly disappears from under me and I'm somersaulting around inside a washing machine, pebbles and grit forcing their way up into my nose and every orifice. This is it. I'm dying. Which way up am I? Then I'm spat out again onto the beach further up than where I started. My carefully tied, elegant little ponytail has moved around almost to the front of my head. Mud seems to be pouring down my face. I pat my body down to check I'm still wearing both parts of my bikini. Girlfriend is laughing hysterically. Oh my God, look at you. What just happened? A wave caught us. There's a sort of shelf where the water breaks and if you don't get past it quickly, well, you nearly drown? Something like that. Come on, let's get showered over there. We'll feel better. I think I'm still in shock. At the dribbly beach shower, I attempt to hose out grit from my bikini bottoms in the least revealing way possible. Finally clean and a bit more refreshed, we buy a cold beer from the beachside bar. Feeling the fuzzy effects of the alcohol immediately, I venture. You know this morning when that man from one of the apartments said, Buenas dias. Yes? Did you say... When is Aries back to him? Oh, bloody hell, did I? What a knob. A recent study of over 11,000 couples found that in-jokes and shared experiences, like perhaps making hapless attempts at foreign languages or getting humiliatingly washing machined in an unexpectedly vicious sea, are a vital part of the dynamic that you build with someone. And that, in turn, is so much more important than the characteristics of the two separate individuals in terms of predicting relationship quality and satisfaction. So next time someone says to you, 
it's not you, it's me. You can call them out on it because science suggests it is neither of you. It's the dynamic between you. So there's just a couple of um, little extracts from the sort of memoir sections of the book. Obviously, it does interweave a lot of science about how relationships work, a lot of interviews from my podcast and other people's breakup stories, as well as my own story of trying to stay in a relationship. But I wanted to really layer those things together. And I talk in the introduction about how I feel that staying together and breaking up are very kind of intertwined, like sort of the stems of ivy I was looking at that day that were climbing up our, our neighbor's wall and slightly obscuring the view from our bedroom window. And I talk about how the strands of our relationships often sort of intertwine and obscure our own view of, of where we are at. So there's definitely a sense of optimism in the book. The subtitle is The Unexpected Joy of Heartbreak. And particularly in the second half, I look at people's stories where they have used a breakup ultimately after the dust has settled and they've got over the really, really awful, painful part as a sort of launch pad for embarking on new creative adventures and reinventing and transforming themselves and women who've maybe become a triathlete suddenly after not really feeling into exercise at all or started really exciting new creative projects and so on so uh yeah I think there's obviously I'm a comedian and there's a obviously a fun aspect and a fun tone but I think an optimistic aspect about breakups as well that is backed up by real surveys and research and science and an input from academic experts about how we can recover from a breakup and how sometimes it, it can almost be the making of us because we can use it as a learning experience if we sort of harness it in the right way there's a there's a certain energy i believe about breakups i sort of call it breakup energy if you like um, so, yeah, the, it's kind of my journey with learning about breakups and how I feel that has benefited me. I mean, it, it, the book's really interesting. because You do have many, uh, so many different sort of strands of input. I was really taken by that when I was reading it. You know, <laughs> you, know you pick up a, a book by a, a comedian with all the kind of a, a great shows you've done in kind of similar areas in a way, you know, and you're expecting that to be the kind of the thing, but actually it's a, a, a genuinely very informative. I found it really interesting. Uh, and it's also, you know, um, very funny, uh, you know, <laughs> very funny on every page you back then. Um, but with all that kind of input, the thing that really interests me as well was how much of this, sorry if this is a, sort of an obvious question, because this is about your relationships, but how much of this is actually you? I mean, when you perform as a comedian, there's Rosie Wilby, but is that Rosie Wilby or is that an act that, you know, you kind of perform your own, you know, a character, as it were, you know, and has that that kind of thing carried through into the into the book? I mean, I don't know if I'm accusing you of being a, a potentially an unreliable witness in your own <laughs> dating history, but, uh, you know, what's the kind of relationship there between you and this material? It's interesting about, I, I believe that we're all unreliable narrators you know, and I talk about how with a breakup, there's usually two different truths, but both of those stories are really emotionally authentic, but they may be very, very starkly different. So I do think comedians often slightly extend their persona on stage. Um, I feel that in the two books that I've written, it is more me talking quite honestly and openly and I feel in a book I've got more space to do that whereas on stage you have to have a punchline every you know I don't know every few seconds or whatever um so I feel that my whereas my comedy persona is a little bit surreal a little bit influenced by sort of Eddie Izzard who I've always loved and I will take things to a sort of illogical conclusion I I have a, a joke that people enjoy about Darwinian evolutionary theory and lesbians becoming really really huge and gay men becoming really really short because 
women typically are attracted to a taller partner and men are often attracted to a shorter partner. Um, you know, but I don't think we're actually really going to be taken over by kind of 10 foot lesbians anytime just yet. Um, <laughs> so obviously on stage, there's a certain, uh, you know, extension into the ridiculous because you're trying to get laughs. Whereas I feel in the book, obviously I do want people to laugh, but I've been more uh, open and honest about describing things that, that are funny experiences, but not necessarily um, enhancing those in, in the way that I might on stage. I mean, for example, one of the early chapters talks about my experience of participating in a sex lab at the University of Essex and <laughs> being shown erotic imagery, which hilariously was broken up with a control clip of a David, At David Attenborough documentary <laughs> to calm me down. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's a kind of peek behind the scenes at what is quite a strange and bizarre experience of taking part in this kind of research into desire and and sexual arousal but i'm you know particularly interested in participating in experiments like that because i'm fascinated in the science of our sexuality and have been for many many years and obviously i've been expressing that through the medium of comedy but it doesn't mean i'm not actually quite seriously interested in how we love and desire one another and then you know uncouple as well um, and I think there's a sort of slight political undercurrent to my interest because it stems a lot from my identity as a gay woman and sort of feeling like an outsider for many many years and feeling that I mean even still when I read endless books non-fiction books about relationships and love there's a disclaimer at the beginning that says, oh, we'll just assume all relationships work the same. And they talk about heterosexual relationships from that point. And I believe that there are many things that are universal about love and lust and desire and heartbreak. Of course there are. We do have the same chemicals going on in the brain when, when we meet somebody we're attracted to and the same kind of withdrawal symptoms when we lose that person. But equally, I think there are some nuanced differences to relationships that happen between two women or two men or between two trans people or non-binary people. And I think I've felt that it's important to incorporate a lot of sort of non-normative narratives sure. and, you know, people who are polyamorous or asexual or just people who have different experiences to that very mainstreamy white heteronormative, middle-class, able-bodied kind of narrative. Um, so I, I just think it's it's been important for me to sort of look at things through a slightly different lens and see how those kind of intersections of prejudice also impact how we are affected by a breakup. Um, you know, for example, there are a lot of other people who speak and write about breakups, but particularly talk about divorce as if divorce is a sort of catch all term for a significant breakup. But in my world, myself and most of my friends have not been able to get married for most of our lives. So therefore we've not been able to get divorced either. So I think for me, making it very clear that I am talking about breakups in an inclusive way, that that does include divorces. Um, obviously, there's a heck of a lot more <laughs> admin and paperwork involved, and it's very costly. Um, but I do think that a significant breakup after you've been in a relationship together for years is just the same emotionally. Can, can I ask you, there because uh, I think there's lots of different points where an, an answer for this question could be in the book. How would you actually define a good breakup or a healthy breakup? What are the key components of, <laughs> of doing this, um, of doing this properly and respectfully, and uh, you know, and without you know damage to a to a you know? Um, a, do, do you have an answer to that? Does anyone? I mean, 
Yeah, does anyone? Well, it goes, it harks back to the idea of conscious uncoupling, doesn't it? Which we all first heard about in 2014 when Gwyneth Paltrow and Chris Martin announced their separation with this seemingly very bohemian, hippy dippy, pretentious phrase that we all thought, oh, God, what are they on about? But actually, the principles underlying the concept of conscious uncoupling are really, really good ones about valuing the friendship and companionship that you shared with that person and maybe extending that and also, you know, a kind of co-parenting together if you had kids or, you know, if you had pets or if you had other you know if you had a home that you shared how do you sort of navigate all of that stuff really really respectfully and maintaining some kind of friendship and family like bond so I think I sort of again sort of talking about my angle on it as a gay woman I do joke at the beginning that if you want to know about breakups and how to do them kindly you should ask a lesbian because within the lesbian community <laughs> they've kind of been we've sort of been pioneering conscious uncoupling for many many decades because particularly in previous generations of queer women there was no real kind of public social space for gay women to congregate. There started to be spaces for gay men, but not until fairly recently were there sort of lesbian bars and so on. And so really lesbian social circles were fairly small and you were probably going to still see your ex all the time. So you had to stay friends. There was just no choice about it. So I think gay women saw it as important if you'd shared that history with someone that you would still keep them close in your life and you do typically see gay women having an ex as their best best friend and you know kind of flat sitting or house sitting or cat sitting or pet sitting for one another or you know being at one another's weddings or <laughs> that kind of thing so you, you do see a closeness typically between ex-partners within the lesbian community, but also more broadly within the LGBTQ community, because I think there's a, a real appreciation of that kind of bonding and, and allyship that you've had with somebody when, of course, you, are, you feel that you may be marginalised at all in the world. Do you, do you think that... The, the whole issue um i mean very rightly so in, in in many ways of the kind of construct of heterosexual contractual based long-term relationships things like marriage and so on so the extension of those in in law now now in you know in the law in the uk for some years did that change your relationship so if you could speak for a community as it were did you just think that introduced something unexpected or unforeseen into the kinds of the natures of relationships that were um you know that you were having or other people were having and so on well of course it's dangerous to completely speak for the entire lgbt community but uh, from my observation uh, observations of data and statistics and friends experiences and my own Yes, I think it has changed things to some degree. And, you know, it's in good and bad ways, in, in a sense, because, of course, it is a wonderful progressive thing that we now have equality. I mean, thank goodness, you know, um, that that is a real game changer. And I mean, I'm actually now engaged to be married to my partner to girlfriend so <laughs> spoiler alert we do stay together <laughs> but the book is really about how do they rather than do they um so yeah um i think that when when same-sex marriage became legalized it was a surprise that it suddenly all seemed to happen quite quickly um I know that I was in the early 90s, I was sort of campaigning and I was on a, a same sex wedding demo as a young student on Valentine's Day outside York Minster when two female friends and two gay male friends got married. 
or spoof married <laughs> and we were shouting through megaphones love is not a crime assuming that this was just pure science fiction and gay people would never get married in our lifetimes so whilst on the one hand it's fantastic that we can get married now we can display our commitment in that way we can benefit legally from having that option available to us and it makes so much difference just to how our relationships are seen and just our personal sense of security and financial well-being and, and all of these things but also I do I did express some sadness when when same-sex marriage was passed because I felt that the LGBT community had in their time spent on the margins outside of the structures of marriage and biological family had come up with some really interesting creative solutions for the conundrum of long-term monogamy, which is really challenging now that we live such long lives. I mean, our brains were not wired for (laughs) living past menopause or sending it children off out into the world so now we sort of have all this extra time when you know maybe we're sort of thinking why am I still with this partner (laughs) you know so um I think gay people had come up with interesting solutions uh gay men many gay men have open relationships and negotiate some form of sexual openness And interestingly, this seems to be very successful because they have the lowest divorce rate of anybody at all, which is really interesting, whereas lesbians tend to be more sexually exclusive, but way more serially monogamous. So so have a sort of higher turnover of partners, incorporate novelty and variety that way. We are notorious for sort of moving in on the second date and moving out again on, you know, the sort of two year anniversary. (laughs) Um, It's, you know, it's a cliche of the U-Haul lesbian who just kind of (laughs) <laughs> leaps into commitment too soon and then we break up and that's perhaps why we've had to pioneer the conscious uncoupling model but it is just another way of incorporating some sort of romantic novelty and variety and I think it's really interesting that we have behaved like that and I don't think it's any accident and I think it reveals some interesting things about our human behaviors and instincts and how challenging long-term monogamy really is which is of course a whole area that I talk about in the first book um though is monogamy dead yeah <laughs> well I, I mean I suppose it's you know the whole thing about sort of marriage the critique of marriage would be that it is a, uh, fundamentally a, a contractual based around the idea of the woman being the property of the man and indeed, yeah and indeed you know uh law across uh, the, the UK um, enshrined that concept, although, of course, it's never talked about in those ways, you know. So I suppose it's those aspects, you know, that actually, uh, uh, of course, you know, the, the feeling of that kind of equal recognition in the face of the law. But then the other thing that comes with marriage, is it, is it you know, is, is it possible to sort of like separate those two things out and have the, that, that feeling of that long road to the equality and recognition? It's amazing, but of course the other thing is that marriage has has its own dark history of that's nothing to do with romance. You know, it really does. I mean, it's so bizarre, isn't it? I, you know, this is what I was saying in 2014. Like lesbians of all people, many of whom would describe themselves as feminists, should surely be the last people to be embracing a patriarchal construct. Uh, But we were sort of running down the aisle. Um, So, yes, it's very complicated. And perhaps if I really had my way, we would abolish marriage and have civil partnerships for everybody Um, because there's really not much difference. But civil partnership doesn't have that historical patriarchal baggage. Mm. (laughs) So, yeah, perhaps, perhaps in my idealistic way I would look at it that way although civil partnership still sounds clunky doesn't it I think people don't necessarily like you know how do you introduce your civil partner it sounds yeah yeah I mean at best a sort of tautology I suppose 
that does it really mean that you are civil with your partner or that you, it's a civil in the face of the law who <laughs> uh, but just 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 moving on to uh, actually the kind of writing and planning process of mm. so not just this book but actually i think it's fair to say that this is as it were a project it has many yeah. manifestations you know mm. um how have you um organized your kind of thought and your kind of planning and your kind of writing and the development of, ide of these ideas it's almost like someone might develop a, a kind of idea for a film series where you've got a sort of a world of or you know a, a whole world of the breakup monologues and you dip in and out of that and it manifests itself in different forms you know how, how did you approach that yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it really all stemmed from that trilogy of solo comedy shows that you mentioned. And when I began that 10 years ago, I did not foresee kind of creating this whole broad portfolio of work of a trilogy of comedy shows, a podcast, two books, um, all kinds of talks and magazine articles, newspaper articles, but that's often how work happens, isn't it? In a rather organic way, you find that you are having very interesting ideas and thoughts. And there are certainly some of the some of the things that I've said in my book about monogamy and now the one about breakups. I don't feel I'm reading everywhere else, particularly the sort of viewpoint of what we learn about male and female sexuality and instincts and behaviours from looking at lesbian relationships and gay relationships. Um, I don't often hear about people talking about how we're an interesting kind of control experiment where you remove the influence of one biological sex and how that might be quite informative and quite interesting. And so, I, you know, I think it's it's been a really interesting kind of whole process and I mean writing a comedy show was something that I'd already done when I came to write the science of sex and I started researching on all the sort of psychology of love and attraction and started going to my local library which at the time was Dulwich Library which is a very beautiful library and sitting and reading all the books in the psychology and love and relationships section and there were some very lovely books that I read at the time and reading articles and also consulting a friend of mine who has sort of on off been a bit of a scientific advisor Dr Kazi Rahman and he's based at King's and he's one of the leading British scientists into sexuality and I've occasionally participated in experiments that he's done um, particularly looking at the sort of origins of our sexual orientation and I've done tests with him in sort of map reading and word fluency and memory and I wrote a bit about those tests in in the first book and he very kindly printed off graphs of results for gay men and lesbians straight men straight women and a separate column for Rosie <laughs> which was fun for me to um, parody in my in my live show of course so I think from that point on I started to develop to develop this voice of combining science with comedy and really I sort of see it as quite important to provide accessible communication about the psychology of how relationships work because there are wonderful experts and academics like Kazi doing great work but then actually I think comedians can sometimes find ways of making that information more engaging to, to the public than just a sort of the results of a study or an academic paper. So I think it's important to apply those. And I've kind of, I guess in all my shows and then the first book and then now in the second book, I've really made myself my own science experiment and looked at, you know, how relationships and breakups are working in my own life and how I can kind of learn and develop and evolve as a human being. But particularly in, in writing the book, though, did your own relationship with this, um, not at all, I mean, I, I assume that there are things and episodes and people who aren't included. You know, how did you, how did you negotiate that? I mean, there must be a kind of a, um, 
I mean, do you feel there's a limit that there's some things you wouldn't or couldn't say, you know, um, in a, even in a, even in a book like this, which by definition is a very open and candid thing, you know? Yes. I mean, there's probably moments where my girlfriend <laughs> wishes I had been less candid and open, but I do feel, um, I mean, my girlfriend is amazing by the way, everybody. Um, and <laughs> she's been very patient about me exposing, um, yeah, some kind of details. I mean, there are certain things, you know, I, I do feel would be completely off, off limits. Uh, but I thought there were sweet things about the way we communicate and connect that I felt were really nice and, and were things that I, I wanted to share. I, th I think it's tricky. You have to negotiate with people that you're writing about. And, um, <laughs> I you know she she has been okay about me sharing some of these things, but it it you know it's it's a discussion and it's it's ever evolving. And I know friends of mine have had similar <laughs> negotiations with partners. My good friend Jen Brister is a brilliant comedian who wrote a book called The Other Mother, and I interviewed her about that. And <laughs> there was a part that she said her partner was really not not too keen on her sharing but her publisher her editor said no that's got to be in so it is tricky um and yeah I mean you do have to create a narrative construct a narrative and find the things that I think serve the kind of story you want to tell um I was very inspired in how I structured my first book and therefore then how I structured this second one when I went to a, a writer's retreat at the University of Southern California that I was lucky enough to get a place on in 2016, where the nonfiction tutor was Sarah Shulman, who was amazing. And on the first morning, she gave this lecture about how nonfiction is very similar to fiction because it's the story of an idea. So I really took that on and made my first book the story of my ideas about relationships and how those were then actively informing how I went about living my romantic life. And so I thought that was really interesting. And she also um, drew this kind of narrative arc on the board about how each kind of incident that happens kind of influences the next one and then another arc underneath which was the sort of emotional arc of what's happening rather than the sort of narrative arc of actions that are actively happening and she then sort of shaded in the area in between and said that's the subtext and so I with both my books I drew a sort of arc and a emotional arc and plotted my chapters plotted my points of what what was going to be happening and what the emotions of what what was going to be happening would be as well and I with this book as I say I've done this kind of challenging structure which which I love a couple of people already have hated it but some people really love it so I think it's <laughs> it's divisive but my comedy shows have always divided people too but this kind of backwards and forwards butterfly painting idea um and I was really really keen to do that but I, I think um you know you do need to sort of draw <laughs> scribbles on pieces of paper to work out structures if particularly if you do want to hop about in time which I did a bit in my first book as well which sort of had a a timeline that informs the first and last sections of the book and then the, the middle two sections are flashbacks um so you do need, really need to plot things like that so you know where you are in your timeline but often I think we know where we want to begin and where we want to end um and it's hard to find those middle bits I'm helping a friend edit her memoir at the moment and she's um, a comedian and psychotherapist and she's had this very very interesting life and she's got this really great kind of opening few chapters and she knows where she wants to end up but it's just finding your way through that sort of longer form writing if it's the first time you've written a long form book which obviously my first book was um, and it suddenly felt very different to writing a comedy show that is you know uh sort of 50 55 minutes or something so it's <laughs> you know maybe if you were writing it out uh word for word which you wouldn't necessarily do with a live stand-up comedy show but it would probably be somewhere between seven thousand words and ten thousand words rather than seventy thousand words <laughs> 
so you know writing a book is suddenly like writing sort of 10 edinburgh shows <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the structure in this book is really interesting. I, I personally think it works really well. I think it, okay. it's a, a sense that you're being led in sort of different directions when you read. And I, I like that. You know, I think it would be very easy to just thematically pursue this in a kind of a, a old, you know, more established traditional sort of beginning, middle and end. Yeah, yeah. And I think that would lose opportunities. And maybe that also reflects the fact that this is, you know from from reading your book a very complex time for um relationships and i, I think also about the interjection of um technology into that i mean there's some excruciating parts in the in, in the book about uh, app-based romance uh, um and it, it made me wonder you know that, that you know that a great sort of non-fiction book so i think all the good non-fiction books and uh, this one very much included in that um has a universal appeal you get the you get the first person but the whole point yeah. of it is that anyone can take a, um a, a strong message it speaks to them they just yeah. read, you know it matters and they recognize the the content and it helps you know bring things out and make people feel more connected i suppose you know but in parts, it would be easy to say that if there is a universal message here, it's, it's that the whole business of relationships is in something of a crisis. You know, <laughs> you know that what what's that it, that it's you know a, a difficult plane, and I'm I'm sure you know mm. all the rest of it has added and a whole other layer to that. But you know, the technology side of it and the app based things doesn't always mm. bring the best in people, does it? <laughs> No, no. And that's another sort of early chapter in the book is the lexicon of breakups. <laughs> and yeah, I've also recorded um, a BBC podcast about the lexicon of breakups as well, because I think it's so interesting how these words have all sprung up, like ghosting and breadcrumbing and submarining and orbiting and benching. What on earth does it all mean? Um, but essentially, they're mostly all words for just disappearing on somebody when you're not that into them anymore. Um, I mean, my favourite one is Marleying, where you pop up again at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I think you're right that there's no code of conduct for how we should treat one another online. And I think that when we are using apps it becomes more like a game dating experts to talk about the gamification of dating culture so yeah it's tricky isn't it um how do we kind of backpedal a bit and reverse that and kind of go hang on you know maybe by giving all these behaviours cutesy names, we're sort of legitimising it and saying, oh, it's all a bit of fun. Oh, I just ghosted her, whatever. Um, yeah. Almost like that, 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 that sort of language in some ways leads people behave, people's behaviour rather than being a, a label that's attached to it when it's recognised as their behaviour. You know, it's a, like, so, well, there's all these things you can do online. You know, um, you know, these are options once they're right. Yeah, so I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is, and it was things, I mean, I presume it's always gone on in different forms in the more analog world, you know. Um, uh, but uh, just to close, so we still have plans for a kind of live show of this. I mean, can we see you in Edinburgh with uh, uh, a stage, hopefully with some of the people interviewed? <laughs> well, <laughs> Um, I mean, my podcast, The Breakup Monologues, will be back on tour as a live podcast show. Yeah. So that will be visiting some festivals this summer. There's going to be um, a big date at Underbelly Festival in August in London, but hoping to be at lots of other festivals as well. I'm booked at Prima Donna Festival, which is a nice one. Uh, Cambridge Comedy Festivals, one or two others that I'm talking to, and then hopefully sort of some dates later on in the year as well. I've often recorded the podcast at King's Place in London, which is absolutely fantastic. But yeah, I would love to come to Edinburgh again. Um, it's, um, I mean, it's an interesting one, Edinburgh Festival. I wonder how the pandemic has altered how that festival will operate 
because there is another chapter in the book where where I decide in 2017 that I'm going to break up with Edinburgh Fringe because there's a lot about it that has become very challenging and very very difficult for performers and I I have not felt comfortable with the ethics of how that festival has evolved really into something that is not accessible to all and and does sort of operate on a system of privilege and does benefit the acts with the right agent and with somebody bankrolling them and with you know kind of wealthy parents and and so on so I I have some uncomfortable feelings about Edinburgh Fringe but obviously it's very very difficult times for the festival and they're having to evolve and so maybe this year a lot of people are going to be able to participate online which won't mean that they have to travel to Edinburgh and pay thousands of pounds to live in a flat somewhere that you know is not necessarily worth as much as that shall we say um (laughs) so yeah I think um it'll be really interesting to see how it evolves because I've had some wonderful experiences at Edinburgh Fringe but I've been concerned at the way that it is developing but I'd certainly love to get back up to Scotland in some way because I've also participated over the years in Glasgow Festival and also Tech Fest in Aberdeen and had some I mean many years ago when I was doing music I did come up and do some gigs in Inverness all the way up there actually so I, I have been there but it was a long long time ago there was a wonderful pub near Inverness Station where we did some music gigs and myself and my then partner who was another musician we had a holiday at a place called wolf lodge i think i can remember it now it was very beautiful and yeah and we'd also i think done some performance at pride scotland as well in that same trip in in glasgow so yeah i have always enjoyed doing um doing scottish gigs but like i say the edinburgh fringe i have i've got an interesting relationship with and i'd love to see it evolve and transform and and i'd love there to be a way of it being more accessible to all but i think it's become so popular that you know the kind of more diy acts now do find it very difficult to get an audience and you know i know people who've gone up there and felt unsafe because i know women who've been in like a dorm in a hostel with loads of men and and whatever and because they can't afford to rent their own room or their own flat there because the the prices are hoiked up so much for august so i'm re- interested to see if there's some way that things can change and and the edinburgh fringe can be more accessible to all again because I it's mean, been a wonderful festival over the years absolutely i mean i i can remember i mean i was at participating in shows at the edinburgh festival at um if it was involved in a show that won was part of the first winning structure that when the Perrier Award was there. And yeah. I, I remember, you know, as a young man going to Edinburgh and it was all about the alternative, whether it was uh, politics or sexual identity or, you know, th- th- that was a very, very large element of it. And Ed- the Edinburgh Fringe was a showcase for a platform, I should say, for, for um, th- that kind of work and particularly the theatre, the emphasis on theatre, that shifted into comedy almost entirely. But mm. I, d- I do wonder, you know, um, just to close well, about whether a lot of that sort of sense has drifted into um, podcasting, which seems, you know, an accessible and, uh, you know, equal kind of medium. This is a platform that um, mm. anyone relatively speaking there is expense involved but yeah. but it's accessible uh, you know and that and that many comedians particularly i think have done an amazing job of grabbing that opportunity you know and um yeah and in fact of, of inventing it before our ears as it you know um uh yeah absolutely i think it's almost like podcasting over the past few years and I think it's like anything it's probably changing now as it becomes more corporate but it's been the new counterculture really um I think every time something countercultural becomes popular it kind of gets absorbed into the mainstream and comedy has had that problem really alternative comedy is no longer because now comedy is mainstream 
So and, and now you've got comedy on telly all the time and you have, you know, the new acts who come into comedy do it because they want to get on television, not because they want to be great comedians who have, you know, really interesting things to say and want to develop their craft. I mean, some of them still do and do that wonderfully well, but there are a lot of people who just see it as a big audition for a TV show and it, the culture of it has changed so much. Um, but, yeah, I think you're right. There's been an anarchy and a freedom to the podcasting world, and that's been brilliant. Mm. Whereas now, I don't know, like anything, it becomes so saturated. It becomes really, really difficult. But I think, you know, I think organisations like the British Podcast Awards do a great job at not only recognising the big successful podcasts but having kind of awards for smaller targeted podcasts that do well at serving a niche audience and have a sort of quality of engagement rather than necessarily quantity so you know I think there are people I see talking about you know assessing podcasts via listen through rates rather than necessarily pure download numbers um so I think there's a lot of good thinking in podcast world and and good kind of ethical interesting creative people in in that world so I think you're right um but perhaps now it's like what's the next thing after podcasting <laughs> that's what we probably all need to yeah. be looking out for our, our, and the book stays with us through it all of course you know the great platform of you know mass communication yeah I mean thank goodness books are still doing well through all of this yeah. um and yeah I'm really delighted to have the breakup monologues out as a book that accompanies the podcast so yeah. yeah it's it's been it's been great to put that out into the world albeit in strange times but yeah really really exciting to oh, yeah. to be able to put it out it's a it's a great read i really and very informative as well raises so many sort of ideas and issues and has that hallmark um of a of a terrific comedian as well who's you know brings that to the page so i really enjoyed it and um thanks also for 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 doing this and um i look Thank forward you. to see what happens happens next thanks so much rosie thank you peter <laughs>